<laughs> Hello, everybody. What's up, guys? <laughs> this is Sharky and her one of her many boyfriends. <laughs> Holy crap. Okay, go on. Okay, all right. All right. Hello, Hello. guys. <laughs> <laughs> I know that it's been a while since we've put anything on our YouTube channel, but today we have some exciting news and a video for you guys. So first, the news. The news. So it's crazy to say this out loud, but our sailing school, Cruisers Academy, is officially taking bookings online at cruisersacademy.com. Yep. So we've spent a lot of time this winter uh, developing the curriculum and figuring out the logistics of how to actually open up a sailing school on Lake Tahoe, California. And um, yeah, so what's in the course? Yeah, so we've pretty much mixed together our sailing experience with our favorite sailing books and what we learned last year starting to teach people and developed a four day course that's perfect for anyone who has either never stepped foot on a sailboat or maybe has some sailing experience but wants to, you know, deepen their knowledge or get more comfortable on the water. So go to cruisersacademy.com. That's where all the information and curriculum and everything is gonna be. And uh, yeah, come sail with us. This summer. <laughs> Isn't that exciting? Come sail with us this summer. I'm so excited. <laughs> but so, yeah, so this project, the video that you're about to watch, mm -hmm. it's a um, interview slash podcast we did with Andy Shell about an expedition that we did a couple years ago into the Arctic, yep. where we went and we sailed for three weeks and we made a four part documentary series. Mm -hmm. So this kind of chat is a cool little behind the scenes look at what went wrong, how we put the project together, a lot of the issues we'd encountered and um, enjoy if you haven't gone and watched the series once you're done watching this you can go to 80northseries.com and watch the four-part documentary series that's it that's it okay see you this summer see ya bye ciao cool well uh if you guys are ready we'll just we'll just go straight for it cool um so how does it feel that 80 north is in the world <laughs> so good incredible man like i feel like i can sleep better and like this huge weight has been lifted off our shoulders and yeah it feels so good really good <laughs> i feel like we've been talking about it for so many years and trying to explain the project to people and say like oh it'll be worth it it'll be worth it and now we can just yeah. say go watch it <laughs> <laughs> yeah it feels good <laughs> yeah like did you guys have expectations going into it versus the reality of how much time you spent in editing this i think it took us a lot longer than um maybe we would have liked because we were working on so many other projects in the background or in the foreground you know it you know we were sailing across the atlantic and producing yeah. all these other episodes and you know kira was still editing delos episodes so we had a lot going on while we were making it um and i think that's why it yeah yeah it, it took us it took us a bit going back like what was it like for you guys when i first sent you that email and said hey you know we're doing this do you guys want to come along where were you guys at in your lives then and how come it was so easy to say yes <laughs> yeah we were crossing the atlantic from cape town to brazil at that point and i think we were all not burnt out but we were all like ready for something different and like that's why we wanted to go to brazil instead of going straight to the caribbean we always wanted to do something a bit different and when that email came through it was like this is it like this is you can't get any more different than this like going into the arctic versus just going to the caribbean and doing the normal caribbean route that everyone else does so yeah i mean the timing was perfect for us because we were in that state of mind like let's just go do something you know, we got to the point with the Delos channel that we were ready to start pushing ourselves, making different kinds of videos. And we always talked about doing something longer format. So it was almost like the universe was just like, here you go. <laughs> and we're like, all right, that's it. Like, you can't say no. I mean, if, even if there was, there was these questions of, is it gonna work? Do we have the time? Do we have the money to make it happen? Do, we don't know how to sail in cold weather. We don't have cold weather gear. It's all those things and you're still like, well, we'll figure it out because there's no way to say no to that. You know, I want to talk about the actual editing of the movie because, you know, from my perspective, we provided you guys the opportunity to come along. It was like, hey, let's do this adventure. But I knew nothing about filmmaking and deliberately that's why we brought you because I wanted to document this trip in a way that I knew I couldn't personally. And it's why we had James. You know, James was our photographer that whole summer. So like... How much footage did you guys get up there just from like a statistics standpoint? You went home with, you know, dozens of hard drives. How much footage actually was it? And then 
What's like the first thing you do when you get home? You're now sitting down. I'm going to start editing this. Like, what do you do first? Yeah. It was about four terabytes of footage, yeah. uh, not including the footage that we lost from Texas Bar when one of our hard drives. <laughs> I was wondering crashed. if you were going to bring that up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we had a hard drive crash up there and we lost some really cool footage from Texas Bar, which is like the northernmost bar in the world. Yeah. Fuck, so it's definitely the. It's definitely something with the drive. It's malfunctioning off the controller. So we've got to try and recover it off the cards then. Yeah, we made it work regardless. Um, and basically when, yeah, when it comes to film projects like that, you just have to, or at least the way that I usually approach it is uh, writing up some kind of an outline. So you just literally like scrub through footage and watch raw footage hours and hours and hours of days uh, of doing that. I hate that part so much. <laughs> like, Boo and I work really well as a team because she she can like scrub through stuff and like get the basic outline of stuff going, and then I can come in and like touch things up and add things, and we pass it back and forth. Yeah, but... I hate the final details. Like when a project's ninety eight, ninety nine percent done, I'm I'm out. Like I pass it on to me. Finish it, and Brady comes in and finishes it. So we work well together in that way. But Kirill, I mean Kirill, scrub through. We did hours of interviews. There was. I don't even know how many we did like three different sessions each session was six or seven hours so there was close to 20 hours of interview footage that Kirill went through and like put it all in its own timeline and just like it's such tedious work lights camera action one two two, two. <laughs> <laughs> you can count the five, so one, two. One, two. <laughs> Three, four, five. The, the, the ice crushes like crystals under your slippers. Cold. Alright. Yeah, I have to find a little, an entry point here. You want this one? <laughs> <laughs> what he said. What are you going to do with your hands? I was going to put them like this. That's awkward. Pick them up. A bit higher. Uh, up. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Huh? Can I sit like this? What's your, what's your uh, zodiac sign? <laughs> what's my zodiac sign? <laughs> Aquarius. Well, it was interesting because like the folks that were at the premiere we did in Sweden and then again in Annapolis, you know, that was a, they were like the bones of what ultimately it became, but like it changed quite a bit from that initial premiere to what the first episode wound up being and that was pretty cool because you know i didn't see any of that process i didn't see the changes behind the scenes i just saw okay here's the premiere we're going to launch and then oh wait here's the brady sends me a you know a link six months later here's the first episode now and then it went from like three episodes to four episodes and stuff got moved around so like how did that whole thing evolve i guess what was there like a like how much did you fit the footage to the outline versus fitting the outline to the footage you know what i mean like how did, did where did it start what was there a story first that you fit it in or did it just kind of evolve i think there was definite parts that were clear were going to be like a highlight of each episode and it was it tended to be the animals um yeah you know the first the first episode was the most difficult for sure because we wanted to try and explain things in a way where if you had never heard of delos and you had never heard of 59 north and you had never heard of svalbard you could still follow along Whereas, yeah, that was the toughest part. Yeah, whereas like in a Delos episode, you don't need to spend the first 10 plus minutes explaining who everyone is because it's assumed that you already watched the channel and kind of have that background. Um, and there's so many characters in this because there's, you know, eight people in the crew. Yeah. So it was, it was, that was definitely the most challenging, I, one of the most challenging parts to figure out how to do correctly so that people knew what was going on but also not bore them. Because um, it's hard when you when you know everything like we know who you are we know who each other are so how do we make sure that that's transferring to other people without all the background knowledge that we have and then the relationships within us as well yeah it's important for people to know like oh that's so and so's brother that's so and so's partner like who is Kirill and ah uh, yeah it's yeah. that was definitely the most challenging part getting that in the first episode and making it engaging enough where people weren't like wait, what's going on? Or this is boring and I'm out. You know, that's, that's, that's the challenge. Well, I think that that's, that's probably the most noticeable change between the premiere episode and the final product. Like, I really liked how that evolved um, because, like you said, we all know each other. 
but you guys, and I don't remember specifically what the changes were, but I recall thinking like, oh, wow, like this is way better. You know, I thought it was good at the premiere and then it's like, oh, wow, this is like way better than, than they did before. So did you guys have like, you know, an like were you test screening that with people that didn't know us to get feedback or how did you do that process? Because I imagine that would have been tough since you know everybody. Because we handed a project back and forth so many times, I think that allowed us to see sort of where the holes were. Um, like, you know, yeah. Kiro would have it and work on it and then give it back to us. And I wouldn't have seen it for two months because we were doing other things. And I would watch it and be like, oh, it's it's missing this. You know, someone yeah. that watched it wouldn't understand this. And so being able to pass it back and forth so many times and look at it with fresh eyes, I think was really helpful in determining, you know, what needed to be added or what the lulls were or, or anything like that. What um what do you think was like the hardest part about getting over that like you said Alex that final 2% like how do you know when it's done Oh I don't know I I for me I just felt it it was like I think we all concurred We all were like yeah. the last round when we passed it around you know we we gave each other notes and and we had a call with Kirill and more importantly and more excited excitingly we're working on small barn episodes. And how are they looking? I do have some good news. I have some good news. And Kirill's like, yeah, I want to do change this and this and that. And like, we started listing off different things. And then we took a step back and we we're just like, this is it. Like, it's done. Yeah. There's no way we can keep doing it. Because I think at some point you start to, it becomes a negative side effect where you just change too much. And it loses its like when you first make it and and there's passion and you and you're super stoked about a certain scene and the way it is and then when you start really looking with a microscope at things you lose the bigger picture of why that scene was so incredible in the first place. And then there's you know color correction, which is a whole another beast of a yeah. situation. Well, yeah, that was gonna be my next question actually. How do you like we just talked about editing the storyline? What is involved in like okay now you have the finished story? What's the next step? Yeah, then you go into audio. We kind of uh, learned a lot <laughs> in this project because I, I did the audio before we did the color grading. So like the audio engineering, like all the sound effects, making sure the levels are good, making sure people's dialogues are heard, there's no wind noise, like you know the, the beluga whale audio, all this kind of stuff. We, we go through that process. And then Kira wanted to do the color grading, so I, I literally sent him a hard drive from California to Bali with the final project on it and he back, backed up i assume oh of course yeah the backups everywhere <laughs> and then when he got that he started the color grading process and he started making some changes to the storyline which threw out the entire audio so then i oh. we, had to, we had to redo that which which took a ton of time and energy and by this point the projects are so big and they've just been passed around so many times like computers are just crashing left and right so it was it was a push <laughs> at the end what, uh, what does color grading even mean? You're basically just taking uh, the same thing as like editing a photo. You take the video and you just try and adjust the colors to make them kind of pop and look really nice. And especially because we use different cameras throughout the trip, like one, one shot from two different cameras will look totally different color-wise. Like one will be grayish and one might be bluish or something. So you kind of have to bring, so, yeah. level them all and just make them like as pretty as possible really. How much of this like technical stuff did you guys have to sub out to like external help? None of it, man. <laughs> really? Yeah. We we had one guy help us with the sound, oh, the true. final sound. Yep, yep. Like Sorry. yeah, what he maybe did ten hours yep. or fifteen hours or something. Trevor, if you're if you're listening to this, he, he, yeah, yeah, he he did the beluga audio, the three D stuff, and he also helped with the um the audio for the narration, making sure it was the same throughout each episode. So like a really warm strong narration yeah sounds um, sound design's really 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 difficult like we can do basic like stuff but we're definitely i wouldn't yeah i don't know i wouldn't call us sound engineers by any means that's a whole nother industry that's yeah. really difficult there's a really cool on, on the plane ride home from antigua i watched a really cool documentary and i f i think it was called making waves and it's about the history of sound design in hollywood and like it's super cool and it's how it's exactly what you guys are talking about how like you know, you had silent films first that were played in a theater with like a live orchestra to create the sound effects in real time as the movie screening. And then you had like, it wasn't until really like the 70s that 
movies had the soundscape that you're that's like a modern soundscape with like the voiceover, the sound effects, the score, the ambient noise, all that stuff. And how like in a Hollywood movie, you know, a, a huge chunk of that is actually put in in post. A lot of even some of the dialogue is re-recorded if they didn't capture it in real time. And it's like the actors come in and dub it over their like they're like lip lip syncing with themselves and like man that shit's like crazy and it's they were, and they were doing it over like actual film so like they'd roll yeah. the film yeah. and like it's rolling and then you're like put the audio now and like oh I can't imagine how crazy that is yeah yeah the thing with sound is you don't realize how when you're watching something with good sound you might not realize it. That's almost like the job of sound. It's supposed to just make you feel there and you don't really notice it until the sound's bad. And then it then makes it really, really hard to watch anything, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, even just this recording we're making, we are ha- we have four separate sources we're recording on. Two local cameras, two local recordings, why I'm talking into this microphone and the finished product, hopefully you won't notice that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And this is just a simple interview. Um, what's what's your guys' favorite part of the of the whole process? Oh man, that's really. T- I mean, for for me, for the for my favorite part of the process for this specific series was releasing it, <laughs> <laughs> was getting it in front of people because I, n- I never thought it would happen. And then when it's out and it's done and the final versions are out to the world, yeah, like I said, it's just a huge weight that gets released. And then you start to see the comments coming in and like the feedback, and you're like, okay, like it is, it is actually good. Like it's not just us. Like actually, people do enjoy it, and it is. We are proud of it. So for me, that was the the best part for this specific project. Yeah, I, I think I think capturing those moments because when you're there in real life, there's certain moments that just have so much hype built around them. You know, like our day of insanity when we saw the the bears and the whales and all this stuff. And so any time that we were able to like capture that feeling and and share that with people and make them feel something, that's why I like film. Right. Um, and it's it's hard to do that, but when you hit those little sweet spots, it's I don't know. It just like it makes me feel high, you know. Yeah, the the music lines up perfectly with the video, and then you throw in sound effects, and it like makes you feel something. Yeah, it's an incredible thing. The uh, I think Karin talked about this in the live stream the other night on the release night, but one of my favorite things about the whole process was that moment when, and you guys did a really good job of capturing this on camera, but that moment when we put the hydrophone in the water and the way people's faces changed like instantly. You know, you were totally caught off guard by what you were hearing in a way that nobody anticipated. Even when you passed the, you, like, Brady, if I passed the headphones to you, you knew it was going to be something cool because you saw my face. But it still doesn't, it, when you listen to it, and, and you guys did a really good job of capturing that. And, like, in the moment, I didn't even notice that you were filming. So, well, James is flying his drone. He said we could take his hydrophone and chuck it in the water. So that's what we're doing, and hopefully we'll get some. Uh, okay, here we go. Some whale songs. Here we go. Oh my it? God! Give me one. It's like a song, like <laughs> seeing their eyes and their their faces when they heard the belugas was really cool and like everyone wanted to grab the headphones and just listen to it and it was like being in the jungle or something. That might be the coolest thing yet. And that's, that was like probably the coolest moment for me having been, been both a part of this process but an observer at the same time because we weren't really involved in the production. That was really cool. Yeah, sometimes di- moments yeah. like that can be so difficult because everyone is so excited, you know? And on top of that, you know, we see something really cool, but also, you know, trying to manage the boat and not like ram it into ice or run it aground and then also launch a drone and maybe get the dinghy in the water. Like, there's a lot going on. And so to be able to pick up a camera and film, uh, it can be, yeah, a lot on top of everything. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that worked out really well for, for this trip specifically. I mean, on, on a normal documentary expedition like this, you'd have like, a very outlined crew of a director, a cameraman, the guy who holds the mic, like, you know, it would be very, and we kind of did everything. All of us held the camera at one point and different cameras. And so I think with that, like whenever somebody was excited and saw that, they could just pick up the camera and film instead of being like, where's the cameraman? Like to capture this, you know, it, it was really a good thing for all of us to be able to do that at once. Yeah. 
on that topic about everybody f- jumping in and filming together, um, another memory that I had, the scene where James was swimming around in the ice. Well earned. Yeah, I get it, in, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After we were sent, standing up on the glacier, I remember I was at the wheel, and once I realized that, like, that ice wasn't a problem, um, and we were just started to have fun, I was at the wheel, but then I also was piloting the drone at the same time as the boat's just kind of drifting along. James is swimming around in the water. You were in the dinghy, Alex, with Brian, I think, like dinging around, and Brady, you and Kiro were on the bow ice defending. That was like, but none of that stuff was spoken. Like, nobody asked me, hey, put the drone up. Nobody asked James to jump in the water. It just all sort of, that was like, the I think, the first time that everybody just, like, jumped into action, no questions asked. It was 3 o'clock in the morning, like... That was that was really cool. I think from then on we sort of came together as a group, and that just stuff just sort of sort of happened. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. I felt that at that same exact point too, where it was just, yeah. I mean, I don't think anybody told Brian to get in the dinghy and push things around. He was just like, Alex, get your camera going in the dinghy because this is going to be some great shots. And then your camera was already in the housing, right? No, I put it in in record timing. Yeah, <laughs> it usually takes a while to put your camera in the housing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that's the cool part about being with people that are that are stoked. And, and I think, you know, our, our, the crew that we are with has obviously a lot of similarities and interests, but then definitely their own interests that they're super passionate about too. So when it, yeah, when, uh, when the moment got really intense, everyone kind of just went into their role and, <laughs> and did what they do best. So it was cool. Yeah. What's your guys' favorite memory of the trip itself of like being there? Oh man. I always... Uh... I always think that it's the beluga whales just because it was just such a cool experience and I didn't expect us to see the whales and then adding we keep going back to the, the, the sound of them like that that has to be one of the coolest parts of the, like an actual experience that we had but other than that I think just overall opening my eyes to what it's like to sail in high latitude places like it's not I'm, it can be incredibly gnarly but it was a lot less crazier than I thought it would be and, and it's a lot more manageable if you plan properly and you're really prepared it's not like going to the end of the world like you're gonna yeah I don't know it was it was a lot easier to manage than I thought it would be I guess how about for you Alex that yeah that day when when we were up on the glacier all night till three in the morning and drinking oh, yeah. some moonshine <laughs> and watching the glacier you know break off and then but and then and then once we realized that the ice flow was going towards the boat and we all kind of started making our way. Well, you and Mia were like running to the boat. <laughs> <laughs> and we were picking, you know, picking up the cameras and finishing our time lapses and stuff and just the landscape had changed so much. I just remember running along the beach and there was now these all these massive like ice sculptures that had washed up on the beach because the the tide had changed and so I was like I knew the boat was in danger and I wanted to like run and get there but at the same time the the what I was seeing was so overwhelmingly beautiful um, and I was a little buzzed. So I was just like sprinting and like Take snapping like 500 photos and then sprinting and going. <laughs> and so, yeah, I think at that moment that led up to us playing around, once we realized it was, you know, a manageable situation with the ice, yeah. I think everyone was just, yeah, very present in that moment. And, and when I think about that, I still kind of get that feeling of like being high on the, the energy of that moment for sure. So I've been, I've been wanting to ask you this, Andy, for a bit, like that specific kind of um, thing that we had with the ice. At what point would you have just like, like it was, it was tidal, right? It was a tidal ice flow. So if the tide kept coming in and big chunks kept coming in, what would have been your kind of fallback plan if it didn't work out like it did for us and it didn't stop? Well, in the big picture, um, I have to say like I, the, the difference between where my expected stress level the whole time we were up there and the actual stress level was couldn't have been wider in a good way like i was i was literally i think i told you guys this i was literally at the doctor in denmark as we were sailing across the north sea to to scotland on the way north to meet you guys which isn't clear in the documentary like we didn't just like start in long Yearbian. we had a long ass way to get there we had to get there from sweden and i was like more stressed than i've ever been in my life i mean i was at the doctor thinking i was having a heart attack i got an ekg in denmark on the way across the north sea because i was like so stressed about the anticipation of this trip and then getting up there and i think that day on the glacier that night was a perfect representation of how chilled out it was and how like 
pleasant. I mean, I remember telling you, Alex, I didn't know which way to look because the glacier's over here and the boat's over there and you have this beautiful mountains in the background. It was just like so extremely beautiful that it was impossible to be stressed out in that moment. And yeah, when, when I saw the, the ice and the drone goggles and stuff, like it was like, it, it wasn't so much acute as it was like, okay, we need to take action now because if we don't, we don't know where this is going to go. So fallback plan, Breedy, I mean, I, I don't know. I guess, um, you know, one thing I was a little bit worried about was if the anchor chain would have gotten fouled on the ice or if there wouldn't have been a way to get the anchor up. And I had mentioned this to you guys before that we use chain and rope because you can always cut the rope to, to escape. Um, and I don't think, I don't think that was a situation that would have required, a, there wasn't a lot of drama. It wasn't windy. It, you know, it was, it was pretty straightforward. And I think that kind of comes across in the whole video that like there wasn't that much drama. And I know that's part of the reason why it's like, well, how do you make a storyline out of this? Cause it was just a, like, I think I talked about it in the movie. It's like, we're just a bunch of children out here having fun in this giant playground is kind of what it was really. So in that, in that particular moment, um, I was, I was on guard, I would say, but I wasn't that, I wasn't that worried about it. And, you know, as soon as we got the anchor up and the boat was free to maneuver, then it was like, okay, this is fine. And we're going to hang out for a while. Yeah. The ice just kind of stopped and like settled in. And then it was like, okay, we can just hang out in the ice and it's not getting any, any tighter or anything. I don't want to discount like, like I do think, I think the reason we had so much success is the amount of preparation we put in. I mean, we spent a whole year getting that boat ready. Um, I had studied the charts. I had met with a whole bunch of people that had been up there before. Um, you know, as cool as it was, Svalbard is like the most accessible Arctic cause you don't get the frozen sea ice. Um, so, you know, I don't want to say it was, it was easier than I expected. There's certainly challenges and stuff up there, but I think, uh, it was more attainable. I, th I, I have this hunch that like some people over dramatize certain places they've been to, to make themselves feel cooler and more accomplished. Like I truly believe that anybody on a well-found boat that is applying proper seamanship can go up there safely and have the similar experience that we had. Yeah. I mean, that being said too, I think that, you know, cause a lot of my friends ask me like, well, isn't it scary crossing oceans or anything like that? And, and honestly, my answer is kind of no for two reasons. We have a great boat and the crew knows, knows what they're doing. There's a lot of years and hundreds of thousands of nautical miles that have gone into, you know, getting that crew to the confidence level where when we are in ice, we can chill in it. Yeah. You know, we don't need to just motor out of there as fast as we can. We kind of got to like revel in that moment a little bit. And I think that um, it's that confidence that just comes with, you know, everyone's experience. And obviously you guys knowing the boat so well that, that allowed us to have moments like that and be a little bit more playful as opposed to having to be, you know, super, super, super safe. We could kind of play in that a little bit. Yeah. I think another thing that really came across neat as, as like watching the movie as a, as an audience member was the fact that none of us had been up there before. And it was the first time all of us had experienced that. I mean, I think it would have been a lot different had you guys gone up there and joined a boat that did that seasonally and was there every summer and, you know, was taking you back to places that they knew and all that stuff. And there was a, um, you know, an, an aspect of like exploration that we had that we didn't know what was around the next corner. And I thought that made it more interesting than if you would have done it, you know, otherwise, or if, or if we go back, I mean, I'll, I'll if I go back to Svalbard, it's not going to be the first time for me. So it's going to be a different, a different way that you view that. Yeah. I think, and I think that that's what made it the, this series really special too, is we were all so excited for everything. Oh. Whoa, that was a big one. <laughs> and when you approach the glacier, you can hear these booming sounds just coming across the water, and it, it sounds like thunder. It's like crap. Oh. Oh. <laughs> that was a block. <laughs> and it's just the sound of thunder booming. Saying, like when you see him from above and you see these cracks go for like kilometers and kilometers in and it's huge like you don't realize that but those pieces that are falling are like the size of houses and bigger
place is mind blown. There's like no other way. Well, you kind of run out of ways to to talk about it, don't you? Mind blown, amazing. <laughs> Yeah, I <laughs> think. The reaction that comes out of that, that chunk dropping is very dramatic and a lot of energy and a lot of power. And yeah, I, I, I mean, I've never seen anything like that before. Maybe after, yeah, seeing a, a glacier calving for, you know, five, five, ten trips a season and we go up there and the captain's like, oh, yeah, there's another glacier calving. And we're just like, oh, it's so cool. And he's like, yeah, it happens every, every day all the time, you know, like the fact that we were all just like, whoa, what is this? And like, we found the walrus, but are the walrus there like every year, same spot, 24 hours, you know what I mean? So I don't know. Yeah, it is really special that we were all on the same page with that. and Everything was so new and so fresh for us. What's uh, what kind of feedback have you guys gotten? Really good. I mean, we the, the the scariest thing from my perspective was the the website that we built for it, eighty northseries dot com. Like the way we built the website and just if it could handle the traffic and and nobody's ever really done something like this. So that was the the hardest part. And we've had a few glitches here and there with the website, but overall, besides that, I mean, the the feedback on the on the series has been really good. Like people are stoked about it loving it sharing it with friends writing personal messages to us so mm -hmm. it feels really good yeah 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 i think i think people realize like how much work we put into it i think it shows and, and they appreciate that which is always a yeah. good feeling yeah i mean the amount of the like how many hours did you guys say you figured you had in the post-production it was it was over two thousand. damn yeah wow <laughs> it's a lot and like that's one thing with with because you know we are charging for this it's a pay what's fair model but we are kind of charging for people to watch and and there's a few uh people which is to be expected like oh i can't believe you're doing this you're selling out you're you're charging money for for a series like this and but most people are like i can't believe how much work you put into this like thank you so much and they're 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 happy to contribute to this to the project you know yeah, I mean you're gonna you're gonna have that obviously, and there, there's thankfully I think I think this is like a good time in the world where people are valuing creative projects, and and there and that should be you know you should pay for that stuff as opposed to the you know the Napster days when everyone's stealing music. That's kind of that not really the model anymore, which is good for all of us that create stuff. I know. Yeah, imagine that back in the day if if maybe somebody already has downloaded the episodes and I can find it on Pirate Bay or something. <laughs> I feel kind of Probably. honored though. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So why did you guys decide to release it in this way? And maybe just mention, you know, it's a pay for pay what you want to do. Ex explain how you came to that model. Yeah, I mean, when we first started throwing this together, we knew we wanted to do something different than just YouTube release. We wanted to, to push ourselves as filmmakers and be creative. And, and uh, the, the goal was to get on to Netflix or Hulu or something. That's kind of like what everybody wants to do in the pinnacle of of yeah, making a project like this is to get somebody, a, a big company, to buy it from you, and then they, they stream it for you. And the more we looked into it, and the more I talked to all the, not executives, but the agents for all of these streaming networks, um, there was a lot of changes, and there was a lot of stuff that they, like drama, right? For example, they wanted to add more drama. They wanted arguing between the crew members. They wanted to change music and, and format and all kinds of stuff, and then all of a sudden it becomes somebody else's project that you're just you're, you're pretty much just editing what they tell you to edit and it's your footage and your story and you're like I don't want to tell it this way like that's not how it happened so the more the more I realized that was happening and the more that's that's what I realized that that's what these streaming networks were going for I really started doing research into a different way to release it and stay true to ourselves and try and at least um, make back the investment that we put into it financially so the pay what's fair model is exactly what it sounds like. You just watch the trailer, you listen to the podcast, you hear about it, and you pay what you think is fair for, for the series. You type in a little number and click, that's fair, and then you get to watch it for forever. I mean, it's, it's streaming on the website right now, and you have unlimited access to it. And I think the pluses to it are we, can, we, we got to hold true to, to our creativity and our editing style, and, and the viewer, like, 
they really appreciate that when it comes to Dallas episodes. But the downside, I think, is it probably won't be in front of as many people as what a streaming network would, would do. So it's kind of a... Yeah, I don't want to speak for you guys, but I feel like this... I can relate to that in a way that, like, you know, this podcast we're talking on, I've been doing this for seven years, and it's built this great, very, you know, um, passionate audience. They're the people that come sailing with us. It's the whole foundation of our whole business. But at the same time, it's like it's not recognized in like the mass sailing world even like you, you know, the magazines aren't writing about it and it's, it's part of like it's part for me it's just like an ego thing it's like god damn it like i'm working so hard on this why can't anybody acknowledge that but then you remember like well hang on a minute i have this dedicated audience that i'm able to communicate with directly and i get to have full control over this it's my thing um and then you remember like oh yeah it doesn't ma- that kind of stuff doesn't matter it's just it's just your ego talking and that's how i feel about it and i don't know if if, that, if you guys relate to that yeah well first of all i think this is the best sailing podcast out there so you do have that going for you <laughs> even if people don't thanks brady i'll take i'll take that from you <laughs> <laughs> i i think too that having a you know with like social media and all this stuff these days you see you can see really high numbers of you know, like followers or likes or anything like that. But engagement, in, in my opinion, is so much more valuable. Um, having people actually comment and care and send you messages and stuff like that. And I mean, we talk to tons of people every day that send us messages and we try to respond to everyone. And I think that, you know, whatever the ratio is, but like a hundred comments is worth so much more than a thousand likes. Um, yeah. To ha- p- have people that are more dedicated and, and just, yeah care more as opposed to having higher numbers yeah so for the series like we'll we'll probably have less people overall that see it but the people that are seeing it are so stoked about it they're going to tell their friends and and they're going to be proud of it and they're going to comment about it and it just feels better to have that instead of have somebody put it on in the background while they're cooking i guess it's kind of two different ways to look at it yeah but the other thing too i mean now that this is like you it's done you have a piece of art that exists and like for the rest of your life, this will exist as something people can watch. So it's going to have very long legs, I think. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see, like, one year from now, five years, ten years, like, where this, how how this, you know, becomes a part of the, of the culture of, like, the time frame and everything like that. Because people are going to still watch it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a really good point. And, I, and it's hard for me to wrap my head around that as well because going back to like our YouTube world, it's like people still watch the videos, but it's like a Friday, Friday, it's a Friday release kind of thing. So it's like the new video is always getting the most attention. And of course, there's a lot of people that go back and binge, but this is like one contained thing. Like it's like watching a whole, you know, the series is just contained and done. So to see where it it goes and to see what happens with it and who it gets in front of is going to be really interesting. Yeah. And and everything we we learned making it too. Like now when we make our next project, we just... I think we have a much clearer vision or, you know, template on, on how to go about doing that. And yeah. so, yeah, I think in that way too, creatively, it's going to, yeah, it's, it's going to, you know, st- keep building a staircase basically that we're trying to climb. Well, I was, that was, I was going to ask you, it's a good segue. Um, I remember when I got, when we got back from Svalbard, I mean, we continued south to Portugal and then went, went across the Atlantic later that summer after you guys left. But when I got back home after we put the boat away for the fall, I had this like simultaneous enormous feeling of accomplishment, but like kind of let down as well. It's like, I've been working towards this for so long. I did it. It's done. Like I felt a little bit lost. So how do you guys feel now having put this out there and, and like what's next for you guys? Yeah, I'm good for a while. (laughs) (laughs) No, I, I know, I know what you mean. And like, yeah, I get excited about, about future filming projects and what we can do. Um, but I know that like not right now. This winter, basically, I'm just gonna like step back from that and just like take a breather and enjoy where we live in the mountains and, and do that. And then, I don't know, the what we have in the future, there's a lot of cool yeah. projects. We have some smaller film ideas in the works. And then also we're going to the Galapagos in April yeah. to go dive for a few weeks. And I mean, the Galapagos are gonna be wild. You know, you guys aren't on Delos anymore. You guys have your thing in Tahoe. I know you've got this Cruises Academy um, getting set up, but 
What is like the future look like for like the core Delos group? You know, Brian and Karen, and you guys can speak for yourselves. And how much is filmmaking going to remain a part of whatever it is that you do next? For Blue and I, I mean, filmmaking is is our passion. Like doing these longer formatted, highly cinematic storytelling stuff. We're going to be doing a lot more of that. That's for sure. And eventually doing some offshore sailing once the world is back to back to normal. So. Combining those two things again, um, I don't know if we're if we're gonna be like YouTube channel similar sort of thing we've ever done before, but definitely making films and sailing and traveling. Yeah, I think less like weekly vlogs for us and more like robust long-term projects, more short film style will be the direction that we take. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we'll never stop making <laughs> films ever. <laughs> So the question everybody wants to know is like, how will you? How do you plan on making a living doing that at the same time? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, I think I think too that that's you know the idea with the Cruiser Academy is maybe we can try to make money in a little bit different way and just go back at least for a year or two or something where we just are, have the film as like a creative, passionate thing, and see where that takes us. Um, and you know, it's it's hard to make money off film for sure. Uh, so. Just take that pressure off it for now, I guess, and just have fun with it and really enjoy it, you know? Cool. Uh, well, I, I'm ready to wrap up if you guys are. Cool. Well, uh, any last words? Uh, <sighs> thank you yeah, for making you. this, like, yeah, the, the inspiration of making it happen. Like, you know, talking about when we were sailing across the Atlantic and what we would have done if we hadn't have gone to Svalbard, it, it wouldn't have been going on a different Arctic trip, you know? We had our, <laughs> our sights set in, yeah. in a very different way, and uh, and I think it's cool that you had something planned, you know, that you had dr dreamed up and put so much effort in that was enough for all of us to leave Delos, which that's never happened before, where like the yeah. whole crew of Delos just leaves and goes to another boat, so. Thanks for the inspiration and yeah, keeping us safe out there. Yeah, you set us on a, on a trajectory to where we are now with this whole series and everything. So really appreciate you reaching out to people you didn't really know to being like, this is gonna be cool. And the moment you do, <laughs> the moment you do that in life, it always, there's always something good that comes out of it, so. I'm humbled to be a part of it, guys. This has been a really fun project, both being involved and watching it evolve after, you know, after we actually did the trip, so. Um, you know, you get you get spoiled when you have friends that can say yes to things like that at the drop of a hat. Yeah. You realize, like, your other friends that lead, quote, unquote, normal lives, you, you don't see them as much because you start asking people like you guys to do stuff because it's like, yep, we're going to we're going to be there. We'll do it. And it's 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 really cool to have have the inspiration and flexibility to do that. So it was it was a blast getting to know you guys. And, you know, who the heck knows where we're going to be two years from now and what adventures we're going to have had and, and where we're going to be. I, I hope I hope it includes another adventure together somehow. So yeah. let's I'm, make that happen. I'm picturing some sailing with some backcountry skiing and snowboarding. I mean, yeah. That's definitely a future film for yeah. us. I think that is right up my... I don't know if you guys can see it, but there's a picture on the wall. It's right behind that light. Yep. Let me see if I can move this. That's me in uh in iceland uh on a sail and ski trip right before we went to svalbard actually so uh yeah if you guys put that together i am there all right cool we'll man. <laughs> <laughs> cool thanks a lot guys i'll uh i'll put all the info for the movie and stuff at the top of this and i'm gonna publish this pretty much right away um tonight or tomorrow unless you guys have any objections to that no nope. just put it out man. thank you so much Andy. i'll publish the audio and then i'll send you the the video and all that stuff okay cool. okay perfect good to see you andy cool yeah, likewise. Great to see you guys. Thanks again. Talk to you later. See you, man. Yeah. Bye. Talking to me, buddy. <laughs> Talking to me. How's it, China? How's it, man? It's got a solution. <laughs> you, you, so much TV, you come here. I think you can come here with your... This is real close. I feel like it's up my nose. Still in focus. You Americans think you can come here with your laptop computers <laughs> and your hand sanitizers? Huh? Trying to save yeah. the world, eh? Yeah, you think you can save the world? Mm, let me tell you something. <laughs> <laughs>